Well, good morning. Great to be here with you. Uh, my name is Phil Payne, one of the teaching pastors here on staff. Uh, I had planned on being with you last week. Um, so we, my wife and I had gone on vacation, and we came back, and we had the incredible privilege to be on the giving end of some resource sharing um, that, that we experienced. So we came back from vacation, and my car was parked long-term at the Marriott parking in Seattle, and someone had drilled out my gas tank and had uh, helped themselves. So again, our privilege to share the resources that we had. Um, I think sometimes you know, people call that stealing. I prefer to think of it as resource sharing. Somebody was in desperate need of some gas, and they saw that our truck had gas, and so they helped themselves to it, which is normally not a big deal. Um, unless it's midnight, at which point a couple things happen. One, Elizabeth, we're spending the night in Seattle, and two, Charlie, you're up tomorrow. So that, that's kind of what happened last week. Charlie did a fantastic job with Gideon um, and missed being with you outdoors on an outdoor service, but fantastic to be with you this morning. We are in the middle of a summer series called Characters with Character. And our goal and, and desire this summer is to take a look at some of the Old Testament characters that maybe we're familiar with, maybe we're not familiar with, and to ask and to look at their lives, men and women, and to ask what is the character qualities in their life, and more importantly, God, are those character qualities showing up in my life? How do I, how do I develop my character? Right? We live in a culture and an age and a day today that talks a lot about talent. Right? What can you do on the outside? What skills do you have? Sometimes we look up to athletes or we look up to people that are, are celebrities or, or whatever it is, and they have talent, but God calls us to live with character from the inside out. You all have talent. You all have gifts and skills. But the question is, how is my character who am I, and how is God developing His awareness and presence in my life? And so as we've been talking this summer, we've kind of focused in and kicked off um, uh, really the verse Jeremiah 6.16. Jeremiah 6.16 says this, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient past, ask where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. We love our new things. We new, love new technology. We love all the newest things that are available to us today. But God encourages us to look. Look for the ancient paths. Look into God's Word. Look into what God has done and is doing. Look for the men and women that have walked with God. Pay attention to that. I love this verse where he says, Stand at the crossroads and look. That means that we've got to slow down. We've got to pause. Our lives live at extreme pace and extreme velocity. And God calls us to stop, to stand, and to look, and then to ask, God, what do you have for me? Who do you want me to be? And God says that he will show up. He will continue to teach us, mold us, shape us. Make us more like Him and less like ourselves. The goal of the Christian life is not to just be a better version of me. To just kind of do behavioral modification. To be a nice person. No, the goal of following Jesus is to surrender to Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the Bible says. The old is gone and the new has come. And that new is Christ. Christ Himself. That He would be the one at work in you and through you. What we say, how we act, how we think, how we interact in our marriages and our families, our neighborhoods and our church, that we would be more and more like Jesus and less and less like ourselves. And so we've been talking about that this summer. We have taken a look at a, a couple of different characters so far. We've talked about Noah. We've talked about Joseph. We've talked about Gideon. And we've also talked about what is biblical faith? And this is really important for us to, to get our head around this, to ask ourselves, where does character come from? How do you develop character? Character, again, is that stamping, that interior person of who you are here. It's the transformation happening. 
as we believe, as we trust, and as we act. And those three things are really important. You see, sometimes we look and we say, well, I believe in God. Well, the Bible says that even demons believe in God. But they're not following God. They're certainly not trusting God. We walk out in the street and on our nation and we ask that question, do you believe in God? We look up and, and again, we, we call it a Christian nation because an overwhelming people, amount of people would say, yeah, I do believe in God. There's something out there. But biblical faith, according to the Bible, is not just believing that there's something out there. It's believing and then trusting that God. Not only do I believe in you, not only do I listen to you, but I trust you. And my trust in you, even when I don't see the outcome, even when I don't know where it's going, even when I don't have all my questions answered, that trust leads to my behavior and my action, that I would act according to what God says. You see, that's what Noah did, right? Noah believed in God. God called him to build a large boat because there was a flood coming. He hadn't seen rain. He wasn't even looking at clouds. But God, I believe in you and I trust you, and that leads to my actions. That's what biblical faith is. Joseph believed in God and trusted in God even when he was sold by his brothers, even when he found himself in prison, accused of something that he didn't do. When he went to the highest of heights and the lowest of lows, he trusted in God, and that led to his action of listening to God and being obedient. That's what biblical faith is. That's a question we have to come back to in our lives over and over and over again. I believe this is God's word. I trust that God is behind it. Do I actually read it? I believe that God calls me to walk with him, to be his example, to be his ambassador. I trust him that he'll give me the words when I need them. Do I share my faith? We can apply that a lot of different ways. But biblical faith is not just believing. It's believing and trusting and acting. And that's where character comes from. God is in the process of shaping and molding and changing your character. Today we continue on in our series and our study, and we're going to take a look at a guy by the name of Joshua. If you have a Bible, open it to Joshua chapter 1. Pretty close to the front of your Bibles. Just a couple of chapters, a couple of books in front of it. And Joshua chapter 1, it's one of those books that gets going right from the beginning. We don't get a whole lot of background here on this guy, Joshua. He jumps right into action. And Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses... Aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you to the Israelites. We meet Joshua, and he's right in the middle of the action. God looks at Joshua and says, hey, Moses, my servant is dead, and you are up. Joshua gets tapped right away. This is watching that movie where the action scene happens right away, immediately. We don't get any background. Now, to be fair to Joshua, he's not new on the scene, right? Joshua, although we don't get a lot of background here in this book, there is some background to pay attention to. He's following a gigantic leader. He's following Moses. If you know your Bible, you know that the Israelites were in captivity, right? They were enslaved in Egypt. And God taps Moses out of the desert and says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to bring my people out. And Moses makes a whole bunch of excuses, and finally he goes, and in dramatic fashion, he, he brings the Israelites out of slavery. And they get to the Red Sea, and there's Moses. He's the leader. He lifts his staff, and the Red Sea parts. This is Moses who's leading the children of Israel. Moses who meets with God face to face. Moses who's described in Scripture that God says, for some people I show up in visions and dreams, but Moses, I talk to him face to face. I call him my friend. This is Moses who God's given the Ten Commandments to. This is Moses who lifts his staff and manna comes down and provides food for the Israelites. This is Moses who talks to God and quail show up. 
water from the rock. Joshua's following this guy, huge leader, challenging. But he's not new on the scene. We go back and we look a little bit. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. That's the the passage about the Ten Commandments. This is Moses about to go up and meet with God, but look at the end of that verse. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide. And Moses went up to the mountaintop of God, and Joshua went with him. Joshua's an intern. Joshua's on a training path. Joshua's hanging out with Moses. Exodus chapter 33, a couple of chapters later, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, did not leave the tent and did not leave his side. See, God was speaking to and through Moses, and Joshua was right there to see it. Here's a little tip in life. You want to grow in godliness? You want to grow in your God awareness? Then find someone that you respect and attach yourself to them. Spend time with them. I remember early on in Elizabeth and I's marriage, there was a godly couple in our little church in San Jose, California, Don and Nan Bozel. And we looked at them and we said, man, they're they're incredibly godly people. And we called them up and said, hey, would you you come over for lunch? We'd just love to get to know you a little bit and ask them questions. They were farther down the road than we were. They had parented and grandparented. They had served the Lord. And we gleaned so much from them by just listening and being around them. Later on, we would move churches. We went to Southern California, and and we were in a a bigger church, but we did the same thing. We found another couple, Sam and Karen McCreary, and we would go over to their house on Sunday nights. And they invited us over and said, we'd just love to have you guys over, and we would just love to pray with you. And we would literally go into their home. We were doing youth ministry and raising kids and trying to figure out life. And we would sit in their living room and we would get on our knees, led by Sam and Karen. And they would say, what do we need to pray about this week? And then they would pour out their hearts for us and with us. You want to grow in your godliness? You want to grow in God awareness? Find some people that you respect and spend time with them. That's what Joshua is doing here. He is spending time with Moses. And then we get to the end of Deuteronomy. And we see that God's involved here. The Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourself at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves in the tent of the meeting. And the Lord gave this command to Joshua, son of Nun, be strong and courageous, Joshua, for you will bring the Israelites into the promised land. And I myself will be with you. So the question is, where did Joshua come from? Why Joshua? What makes him uniquely qualified? Here's the bottom line. God chose Joshua. God chose Joshua. And God said to Joshua, I will be with you. Here's the reality. For a lot of you in this room, God has chosen you. God has chosen you to lead your family. God has chosen you to be in your marriage. God has chosen you to be in that company. God has chosen you to be involved in that school or that organization or that ministry. And God says the same thing to you. I will be with you. Why is Joshua here? Because God chose him. Why are you where you're at right now today? Because God is choosing you. And just like Joshua, you have a choice. I have a choice. Will I listen to God? Will I pay attention? Will I step up? Or will I say, you know what, God, choose someone else. Choose someone else. I don't want to do this. Maybe God's put you in a position where you're following a leader. And you're asking yourself some of the questions Joshua did. How am I going to do this? I'm not qualified. I don't don't have all the leadership skills that Moses had. I'm not sure about all of this. I love that God doesn't answer all those questions for Joshua. What he says to him is, I will be with you. I will be with you. 
And that's what God promises in your life and in my life, that he will be with you right now, right in the spot where you are. Following a leader like Moses would have been challenging. Challenging for sure, but God knew that. God was aware of these challenges. And so we go back to the story here in in Joshua chapter 1. It says, after the death of the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant's dead. Now you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River and into the land I'm about to give you to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, the Mediterranean Sea to the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The children of Israel have been on a journey. God said to them from the very beginning, I will take you to a promised land. It's Canaan. I will take you to a place and I'll provide for you. The problem with the Israelites was they didn't really believe God. They tested him over and over and over again. And so their journey that should have been just a series of weeks ended up being over 40 years. An entire generation dies out. But God's faithfulness continues. And God says, I will lead you to this land. Moses was in charge, but now Joshua's in charge. But God knew all about Joshua's insecurities. God knew that Joshua was not chomping at the bit to say, now it's my opportunity to take over. No, three times God is going to say to him, be strong, be courageous. Why would God say that? Because he knew that Joshua was anything but strong and courageous. Everything Joshua has experienced at this point in time has been through Moses. He's always had the privilege to say, well, that's not up to me. That's up to Moses, actually. Oh, I don't have the final word. Moses has the final word. Oh, God doesn't talk to me. He actually talks to Moses. Everything he has done has been through Moses. And now the transition happens, and God says, you're up. I'm tapping you. I want you to be the leader, and so be strong and courageous. You know, for some of us in our lives, we've been handed Christian heritage. We've been handed Christian faith. Your parents were godly. Maybe your grandparents were godly. Maybe you had a pastor in your life that was godly who handed you faith. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to rely on people from behind you and to go, you know what? It, it's their job and God speaks to them and I've been the recipient of it. When God says to you, hey, I want to speak to you. I want you to pay attention to my word. I want you to listen to my voice. Joshua finds himself in a primary position. And so verse 6, God continues and he says, Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or to the left. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever you go. How is Joshua going to pull this off? Not in his own strength. He's going to pull it off by remembering a couple of things. One, God says to him, I will be with you. And then he also says to him, be strong and courageous. Three times he says that. And finally, he says this, be careful. Be careful. Pay attention. You know that moment where you tell your kids, pay attention. This is important. Follow all the details. Are you listening to me? We have those conversations with our kids, right? God is having that conversation with Joshua to say, be careful. Pay attention. Pay attention to what you have learned behind you. Don't forget that. Yes, Moses, my servant, is dead, but don't forget what you learned from him. But don't just rest there. Don't just stop there. You and I cannot stop in our historic Christianity. We cannot stop just holding on to what we've learned yesterday or last week or in Bible college or when we were kids. What is God teaching you today? How are you actively hearing his voice today? 
How is God at work in you today? When I reach a point where I'm constantly drawing on just my historic Christianity, I'm in trouble. God says to Joshua, hey, pay attention to what you have learned, but pay attention now. Pay attention to my word. He says, be careful to meditate on it. Be careful not to turn from the left or to the right. Be careful to follow everything that you see in here. I'll be with you. Pay attention to me. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What does he mean by that? Is that riches? Is that bank account? I don't think so. I think that what that is, is that's a God awareness that Joshua lived with. That's a God awareness that no matter what is happening around me, when I was walking and Moses was in charge, I had God awareness. Now that I'm in charge, I have God awareness. He wakes up in the morning and says, God, this is your day. Help me pay attention to you today. He finds amazing moments, which he will in his life, and he doesn't get too caught up in his own ego and his own prosperity. He says, no, no, God, you did this. When he has really hard moments where the people are going to look at him and go, you know what? To be honest, you're not Moses. Ooh, that's going to be a tough moment. It's coming. In those moments, he has God awareness. How's your God awareness? How's your ability to move through your day, no matter what is happening around you, and you're aware that God is at work and God is at work in you? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You're hearing His voice. You're remembering His word. You're paying attention, and the circumstances around you, you're like, oh, God, what are you up to here? Oh, God, this is hard. I need you. See, that's what being successful and prosperous is, is the God awareness. God says, I will be with you. Be strong and courageous. Be careful. Joshua was not confident. He was not strong. I don't know about you, but I take consolation in that. Sometimes we want to make all the leaders of the Bible superheroes. They're not superheroes. You dig into their lives and you see that they had moments that were really difficult. You and I have moments that are really difficult. You and I have moments where our temper gets away from us. You and I have moments where we struggle to be obedient. You and I have moments where I'd rather someone else do it than me. Joshua had those moments. And God says, I'm going to use you anyway. So be strong and courageous. If there's one thing that I would camp out on in the life of Joshua, the one thing that I want you to take away today is that Joshua's quality in his character that I want to hold on to today is the ability to be committed. Commitment. Joshua was committed. Committed to God, committed to what God said, and committed to what God asked him to do. That's what God says to him. Don't waver. Don't turn left or right. I want you to be committed I want you to pay attention. God says to him, I will give you the plan, and I want you to be committed to that plan. Be committed to being strong, even when you don't feel strong. Be committed to being courageous, even when you don't feel courageous. Be committed to what you've learned in the past, what you're learning now. Be committed to meditate on God's word. Be committed to do everything written in it. He was committed to God and committed to the task. Joshua developed commitment over his life. Character is not something that just shows up. We take a pill or take an injection. No, character is developed when we're young. Now, little choices, big choices. Character happens as we believe God, as we trust God, and as we act, or we don't. You see, every time I hear from God and I choose not to act, that leaves residue as well. The Bible says I can actually quench the Holy Spirit. I can, I can silence the voice of God. See, sometimes people say, well, God doesn't talk to me. God wants to talk to you. He wants to talk through his word. He wants his spirit to be teaching you. You and I can grow in sensitivity to God every time we choose to be obedient. The volume of his voice increases. And every time I hear the voice of God and I choose not to be obedient, Guess what? That volume decreases. And sometimes the noise of the world or the noise of my life drown out the voice of God. It's not that he's not speaking. The truth is I'm not listening. 
Joshua, be committed. See, commitment, if we were to define it, it's the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or an activity. That's what commitment is. Commitment is an engagement or an obligation that restricts freedom of action. You see, when I'm committed to something, it means I can't be committed to something else. By its very definition, the word to decide means to cut off. When I decide to do something, I'm cutting off other options. Joshua said and stepped in and said, I will be committed, God, to you. I will decide to listen and act on what you're saying. When we decide something, we're cutting off other options. When we are committed to a cause, an activity, a person, to God himself, it means that I'm choosing not to dedicate myself to something else. I think it's one of the challenges today. Why is it so difficult for people to commit today? I think as we look around, sometimes there's an epidemic of people saying, well, I don't really want to commit to that. I want to keep my options open, we say. That's one of the things that's very true today. We have so many options, more options maybe than any other time. And we look at all those options and we get paralyzed. It's like, where am I going to go to college? I could go to all of these places. Just pick one, right? Just pick one and go there. But sometimes I look at all of these options and I'm afraid that I'm going to miss out. What if I miss out on the best opportunity? Sometimes in relationships, right? How, how, how do I know? You know, make a commitment and step in. But today we, we struggle with that because of options, sometimes because of the fear of missing out, sometimes because of my own ambition. My own ambition drives me to not be committed to anything. Because I always want to make sure that I'm in the primary seat and the primary position. Commitment is a challenge. You talk about the average American today in their career or their job, the median employee tenure in the United States right now is 4.3 years for men and 3.8 years for women. That's how long people are staying in jobs. Four years or three years, and then I'm changing jobs. Now, there's, sometimes there's good reason to change jobs. Sometimes you get better opportunity. But, you know, we look back sometimes a generation before us and we go, what, you, you worked for that company 30 years? You were there for how long? Now, that, that, that landscape's changing too, right? Companies are not as loyal to employees as they once were. But sometimes we're afraid to commit to a job. The average American will move 12 times in their life to a new location. Again, sometimes there's great opportunities to move and a reason to move. But sometimes we just get a little bit of that wanderlust that what if it's different over there? And I'm afraid to commit to one place. The average length of marriage in the United States today is seven years. Seven years. Only 35% of marriages today will make it to 25 years. Only 6% will make it to 50 years. There's some reasons for that too, right? But are you willing to commit to saying, you know what? I want the longevity in my marriage. Are there reasons to step out of a marriage? Absolutely. Absolutely. Find yourself in an abuse situation, a difficult situation. I'm not saying there's never a time for marriages to end. But sometimes marriages are ending today just because we don't want to commit to something. It gets difficult and hard, and I'm out, and I'd rather find something else. Commitment is the backbone by which we should be living. Here are a couple of reasons to think about. What, what are the benefits of, of commitment? Commitment leads to trust and influence of others. When we stick around and we're committed to a relationship, an organization, a place, it leads to influence. Commitment helps you deal with discouragement and difficulty, See, when things get hard, if I'm committed to be in that situation, no matter what, then I realize, you know what? Difficulty is just part of the landscape. I'm not going to jump out just because it got hard. If I'm committed, I'm committed. Commitment leads to cooperation. You see, when the people around you see you're committed, they're much more willing to work with you, to listen to you. Commitment leads to cooperation. Commitment also leads to productivity. 
Sometimes that relationship, sometimes that job, sometimes that school, sometimes that project you have going, it takes some time. When we jump out too early, we miss out on productivity. Commitment grows steadily over time. I've shared with you before, I remember moving to Ecuador. We were working in California as a youth pastor in a, in a large church in Southern California, and my wife and I and our four kids moved to Ecuador in the summer of 1999. We went down to be part of a youth ministry organization, and I, and I still remember vividly the first night landing there. Elizabeth had gone to bed, kids had gone to bed, and I walked outside of the little house that we were staying in until we could find our own place. And I looked out over the city of Quito and the twinkling lights, and this thought just washed over me. What in the world have I just done? What am I doing here? Man, I just left a job, I left my family, I left stability, I left everything for what? Because everything in front of me was unknown. It was this idea and concept that we were going to take youth ministry down and we were going to impact a continent through youth ministry. 300 million teenagers in Latin America. And there in the darkness of that night, God whispered these words. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Because I have led you here. That was clear. God opened the door. God gave us the opportunity. God provided the resources. God moved our family down there. Do you trust me? And that night I said, God, yes, I do. Then commit. Then hang in there. I'm here. I will be with you. And those words are so important when you're trying to learn a new language, when you're grappling with a culture that's radically different than yours, when the frustration of day-to-day -day life, when you're pouring out your heart and it doesn't seem like it's making any difference, God says, I'm here. Commit to this. Fifteen years, we worked, and God courageously built out an organization today that there's over 100 people still impacting Youth ministry and young people. Some of the people that we've been working with that have come up through our street kids or through camping ministry or through church ministry, today they're leaders in that organization. Elizabeth and I will be down there in the next three weeks spending some time with some of those people that today are walking with Jesus because God is faithful to what he says. And when you and I trust him, when we believe him, and when we act on what he says... God wants to build something through your life. God wants to build your family. God wants to build your marriage. God wants to build your impact in your community. God wants to build this church. And this church would not be here today apart from God's faithfulness and the faithfulness of a young couple who left Bible college in their 20s and moved to this little place called Moses Lake and stepped into a church of less than 20 people. And said, I'm willing to preach and teach and set up chairs and do whatever I need to do. And 35 years of committing to Moses Lake Christian Church. God's commitment to this church. And John and Charlene Roberts willing to commit. They had other opportunities. They could have jumped somewhere else. They could have gone to another community. They could have started another church. When they were setting up chairs in a school, long before this building was here. When they were looking up in this community going, are we making any difference? John and Charlene committed long term. And the faithfulness of God is why you and I are worshiping here today. But it came through commitment. Joshua believed, he trusted, he acted, he grew in commitment. That commitment was about to be tested. If you're still in Joshua, flip over to Joshua chapter 6. And, and, and remember what God says to them. God says, hey, I want you to cross the Jordan. You're going to go into Canaan. I'm going to give you that land. I'm with you. Be courageous. And so their plan is they're going to step across. And now they've done it. They've come across the Jordan. They're sweeping into what we know today is Palestine. And the Palestinian peninsula is long and narrow. And the children of Israel, under Joshua's leadership, 
They're going to sweep in and they're going to go to the south. They're going to go to the north. They're going to go to the west. They're going to go to the east. This is the promised land that God has given them. But right there in the middle of that peninsula is this gigantic city called Jericho. And Jericho is sitting right in the path of God's faithfulness. And this is about to be a character-building moment for Joshua. Because you and I, when we're committed to God, you're committed to your marriage, you're committed to your family, you're committed to God's faithfulness, you're going to run into Jericho. You're going to run into that right in the middle of your path that this thing looks huge and it looks too big for me. And I don't know if I can do this. You see, in Joshua chapter 6, it says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with the king and his fighting men. And Joshua must have said, Yes, you have. This is the land you gave me. This is the land you've been faithfully promising. We're here. But God, i got to be honest. There's no one coming in and there's no one going out. It's not like they threw open the doors. But I'm here. We go back to the very verses we read in chapter 1. Remember what God said? I will give you every place that you set your foot on. Just as I promised Moses, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And here in verse 2 of Joshua 6, he says, I've already delivered it to you. I've already delivered the city and all of its fighting men. And at this point in time, Joshua must have been thinking to himself, man, I'm a pretty good strategist. So we got to get some ladders. We got to get some ropes. We got to get some spears. We got to get our fighting men ready because that city is huge. Archaeology today will tell you that Jericho was the largest city of its time. Over 3,000 inhabitants lived there. Walls thick enough that you could race a chariot on it. Fortified city. When anybody came against Jericho, their strategy was come and get it if you think you're big enough. We're just going to close up the city. We have enough resources. We have enough food. We have enough water. We have enough fighting men. But more than anything we have, we got that wall. And that wall keeps everybody out. And Joshua's walking along, and this moment is about to be character building. But remember what God's told him. God says, you know what? I'm with you. Be courageous. But most of all, be careful to listen to me, because I will give you the plan. And so people come to Joshua, and they're like, hey, what's the plan? What are we going to do? And he says, well, I don't, I don't have that yet. But, but God's brought us this far, and God's going to give us a plan. And so we keep reading it, and sure enough, God gives them the plan. And then the Lord said to Joshua, hey, be careful, pay attention. I've delivered Jericho into your hands. So here's what I want you to do. Joshua, I want you to march around the city once with all of the armed men. Okay, I can do that. Armed men, let's go. Come on, get all the armed men together. We're going we're to march around the city. Check, I got that. Okay, I, I don't want you to do this once. I want you to do this for six days. Okay, all right, we're going to intimidate them first. I get that. That makes sense. We're, we're, going to, we're going to march around the city. We're going to do it once. And so they, you know, first day, and they, we've got that plan, and they're going to march around. They're going to go back to their camp. And we're going to do this for six days. Okay, I got that, God. Good plan so far. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horn in the front with the ark. Wait, what? We, what, what about ladders? What, what, what about swords? What about ropes? God, you, you know there's fighting men inside those walls, right? And you want me to put the band out front? <laughs> this isn't making a lot of sense. Here's one of the challenges for you and I to commit to God. One, his plans don't always make sense to us. You think you know how God should work. I think I know how God should work. God, I was thinking more tornado. I was thinking more fire from heaven. I was thinking more, you just, you know. And God says, you're going to get your people together. You're going to march around the city. You're going to do it for six days and put out front seven priests, the ark of God, with some trumpets. Oh, and and let me give you a couple other things. No, No war cry. In fact, I I don't want any cry until I tell you. And when I tell you, that's when you're going to have everybody yell. 
And so Joshua says, that, that's the plan, God? Okay, all right. And then Joshua goes and he tells the people the plan. And here's another thing that's pushing you and I to commit, is comparison with another leader, either internal or external. God's put you in a position of leadership. God's put you in a position that he wants to use you, and you want to compare yourself to someone else. You know, I'm not sure Moses would have done it this way. You know, when Moses got to the Red Sea, he just lifted his staff. Can I just lift a staff that actually I don't have? God never gave Joshua a staff. Can't we do something different here than march around the city? When you and I choose to compare ourselves to someone else, instead of how God has created you and given you gifts and skills, you're really doubting God, and I'm really doubting God. God, wouldn't it be better to use someone else? Sometimes the plan God gives us is challenging to commit to. Sometimes comparing ourselves to someone else. Oh, I think they're better qualified than I am. And our personal insecurity kicks in. That's why God told Joshua, be strong, be courageous. You're going to have moments of insecurity. Be strong, be courageous. I'm with you. Trust me. And so Joshua says, yes, I am committed to that. And we read right here in verse 6, So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, This is what the plan is. And the children of Israel marched around the city once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times, and then the trumpet sounded, and the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, the men gave a loud shout, and the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoured the city the Lord had given them, and they destroyed everything with the sword. God comes through one more time because God is faithful. And the city wall didn't collapse out. The city wall collapsed in. Don't miss that. God even saw the details. Because when the wall collapsed, the children of Israel rushed into the city. They can't rush into the city if the wall's falling on them. The wall fell inward. Archaeologists today back that up. One more time, what God says he's going to do, he does. We believe him, we trust him, and we act on what he says. We commit to that. The climax of this story happens in Joshua chapter 11, where Scripture tells us that Joshua conquered all of the land and gave it to the tribes, and the land was at peace. And we see Joshua at the very end of his life in Joshua chapter 24, still committed to God. Joshua gets to the end. He's going to live to be 110 years old. He has taken the mantle of leadership. He has believed God. He has trusted God. He has acted on what God said. In the moments that he didn't feel strong, he committed to strength from God. In the moments he didn't feel courageous, he committed to courage from God. In the moments where he wanted to compare himself to someone else, he remembered and committed himself to God. When Jericho showed up in front of him, seeming like an obstacle that he couldn't overcome, he committed himself to God. And Joshua 24 says, at the very end of his life, this is Joshua's words, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua says. You see, here's the scary thing. The children of Israel had a choice. You want to serve God? He's faithful. He's the one who has led us here. He's the one that always provides. But if you choose to serve someone else, God loves you enough that he'll let you do that. 
Now, why would you? That's a whole other conversation. But today, you and I have the same option. Who are you going to choose to be committed to and serve? Joshua says, as for me and my household, I'll tell you where we're going to be. We're going to be serving the Lord. And I want you to catch this. When you commit, when I commit, commitment is contagious. It's contagious. Later on in this very chapter, the people look up and they say, hey, you know what, Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God, and we will obey Him. You want your kids to walk with God? You have to walk with God. You want your spouse to walk with God? You need to walk with God. You want to see generations of godliness coming out of your house? It starts with you. Commitment is contagious. Don't wait for someone else to pick up the mantle. You pick it up. Don't wait for someone else to take the leadership spot. You pick it up. A couple of really, really, really practical things for us to think about. Of what, what leads to commitment. I, I want to encourage you just to be committed to a few things. One, I want to encourage you to be committed to God's Word. How you doing? You know, we start out the year and we're really faithful and I'm going to be in God's Word and I'm going to read and I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm there every day. But now we're in July, hot outside. There's a lot going on in my life. God said to Joshua, be committed to my word. Don't turn from the left or the right. Meditate on it. Pay attention to everything in it. How you doing being committed to God's word? Sharper than a two-edged sword. Able to divide bone and marrow, soul and spirit, judging the thoughts and attitudes of us. Not to condemn us. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you and give it to you life better than you could imagine it yourself. Be committed to God's word. Number two, be committed to your word. What have you said to yourself or to someone else that you still haven't done? Remember, commitment starts in little things. Be committed to your word. Be committed to your promises. Men. I'm going to call you out just for a second. I don't have a counseling practice. It wouldn't be very successful because my premise on marriage is that 90% of all marital problems are men's issues. You may not like that. I don't like that. But I think it's true. Men, if you will do your job, if I will do my job walking with God and loving our wives and serving them and serving our families... You will have very few marital issues. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm not saying your marriage will be perfect. But you stood before God and men and said, I will love her in good times and in bad times. How you doing? Through sickness and in health. I will love, I will serve. As God loves me, I will love her. Men, how you doing? How am I doing? You made a promise before God and men, holy matrimony, till death do you part. Unless she kills you or God kills you, be faithful. (laughs) Don't give up. Don't quit. Be committed to your marriage. Be committed to doing the right things. Be committed to God's word. Be committed to your word. Be committed to promises. Finish the task all the way to the end. You know, sometimes we're really good at starting something. We get it going. We get it 80% of the way. And like, I just don't want to finish that. Right now, we're remodeling our house and put a few new windows in. Thank you, Connie. She did a fantastic job selling us windows. But you know what I got at my house? About 80% finished. I got to put the trim back up. I got to put the caulking up. I got to put the paint up. Can I, this looks great with drywall. What do we need all that other stuff for? <laughs> finish, right? That's where commitment comes from. Choosing to finish. Here's another thing I want to challenge you to do. Do less. One of the reasons that we struggle with commitment is we have so much going on in our life. You need to create some margin. It's okay to have a day off. It's okay to see a weekend and actually spend it at home. 
There's so many side hustles and hobbies and things that we're going at such a pace. We're fear of missing out. We're comparing ourselves to other people. We want to be committed to our families. That takes time. We want to be committed to our marriage. That takes time. You want to be committed to being God's word. It takes time. You want to be committed to this church. It takes time. Do less. Create some margin in your life. Some of you today are facing a huge Jericho and you want to quit. And God says, I'm with you. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I know it looks big to you. Finances, job, your family. Don't quit. Ask God to help you develop the character quality of commitment. Some of you are struggling with what others are saying about you. Maybe you're comparing yourself to someone else. Finding reasons not to commit. God says commit. God invites you to deepen your character and develop the character trait of commitment. Believe God. Trust God. Do what he says and hear the words of Joshua Fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Where's that area that you want to quit? God says he's with you. He sees you. He provides for you. He's even with you in the midst of that moment. God says, I'm here. I'm going to pray and we're going to finish. There'll be a couple of people up front here that would love to pray with you. Maybe you just need someone today to physically pray with you and say, you know what? God's faithful. Maybe you don't even give any details. You just say, I just need someone to pray. And people up here would love to pray with you. How's your commitment? How you doing? When the world says quit, God says keep going. Believe me, trust me, act on what you know to be true. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. Thank you for the example of Joshua, a man who developed the character of commitment. Lord, thank you that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. Thank you that you're willing to give us the plan and the resources and even the ability to execute that plan. That all comes from you. I pray that you would give courage today. You would give perseverance today. You would strengthen hearts who are turned to you. Help us to be people of commitment. Thank you that you are a God of commitment. That what you say comes to pass. What you promise you do. What you offer you deliver. Thank you that you call us to be a little bit more like you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.